All right, good morning. Yeah, this is a little P.S. message to our Dwell series that we've been on the last couple months. And uh, man, isn't it great to kind of hear what God does in people's lives, isn't it? Man, there's just something powerful about hearing what uh, God's done in another person's life. It makes you kind of remember what maybe He's done in your life. And uh, that's really what this message is all about. So let me ask you, um, how many of you have a story of God's intervention in your life? God's intervened somehow, or maybe God's faithfulness in your life, God's provision in your life, uh, a story of God's healing or victory, victory over addiction or bondage in your life. How many of you have a story? Amen. Can I get a witness? All right. Well, I believe God wants to open your eyes this morning to just how powerful those stories are. How powerful the story that God is weaving in and through your life, how truly powerful it is in His hands. See, really the problem is we rarely share our story of what God has done to others. It's as if spiritual conversations are exceedingly rare in our culture, even among Christians who are at best reluctant sometimes to even share their, their story or a portion of their story of what God has done. Sometimes there's this feels imposing or, or maybe our foundation is so compartmentalized we can kind of eagerly celebrate on Sunday morning, but yet when Monday morning comes around, we're kind of back in our nice secular box and we're kind of God's person out there, but our mouths are relatively silent. Or maybe, maybe you just think that your story isn't that powerful or significant. And a lot of times it's that latter. You just don't feel that your story or what God has done in your life is significant or powerful enough to make any kind of difference in another person's life. But we're, gonna hear, we're here today to say that's a total lie. That's a total lie. This, this, this may shock you. A third of the unchurched admire the faith of their Christian friends. A third. So one out of three unbelievers that are around you, and if you're actively living your, your uh, faith, one out of three admire what you're doing. Over half of the unchurched, this is even better, over half said that they would freely discuss spiritual matters, and it's increasing, because this was 2018. Half totally are willing to have an open conversation about spiritual matters. But yet a lot of times in our head, we do something without even realizing it. We say no for the other person before we even open our mouth. Right? That's the kind of, a lot of times the scenarios that play out in our head. We think a situation arises or we, there's a moment, and we think if we open up our mouth, what's going to happen? And you kind of get like sometimes fear pictures just in your head. And a lot of times, like we say around here, a lot of times fear, projections of fear, what's in the future without God. They're all projections of what life would look like without God's presence, without God's faithfulness to your life. And yet, if God has indeed done something in your life, He's given you one of the greatest gifts, one of the greatest instruments, what, dare I say, greatest weapons in this spiritual war that we're in. I believe the enemy blinds us like he does with prayer. He blinds us from the power of your story, of what God is doing in your life, to keep us from being effective in the fruitful man or woman of God that he's designed you to be. So that's our premise. We're going to dive in and see what God's Word says. Revelation 12, verse 10. It says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink 
from death. If you want to know the most powerful weapons in God's arsenal, it's the gospel, it's your story, and you loving your life not unto death. This is what John, through the book of Revelation, lays out. So let's break this down a bit. Three ingredients that defeat our great enemy, the father of lies and the great accuser. First, there's supernatural power in the gospel. The gospel of the new covenant of the kingdom, established by Jesus' blood on the cross and his resurrection. The truth of what he's done, the perfect unblemished sacrifice. May I remind you, death and eternal separation from God are our default position. That's our default position. You and I have been crucified with Christ. Whoa, I skipped ahead. Yet God in his faithfulness and love gave us the remedy to restore us to himself directly through Jesus. And that gospel, demons in hell shudder about that truth. And you can talk, there's so many testimonies that you can look online or even ask around. But demons know that the gospel has power, and they try all with their might to malign it, distract us from it, twist it, add to it, take away from it. So he says that's, that's the first and key tool. And then, then at the end it says, there's something about not loving your life unto death. Paul says, you and I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I or us who live, but Christ who lives through us. It's like what Paul said in Romans 12.1, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. If you're a son or daughter of God, you've already laid your life down on the altar. A living sacrifice. Living dead. So it's a transaction that's already transpired in their heart. I'm already dead. I'm alive to God. This world can do nothing to me. And then, key in on that second one, the, by the word of their testimony, there's something supernaturally powerful in telling others what God has done in your life. And we sensed it today already. And we heard about, man, wow. Testimony. A testimony is whatever God has done in any time and anywhere in your life, through your life. Stories that you've heard of others, what God has done in other lives, that becomes part of your testimony to a bell. We'll get to in a sec. But let's look at some examples in Scripture. Some, uh, there, in John 4, Jesus is walking through this land called Samaria. Now, Samaria had a little uh, shady background in that they were... Jewish people that intermarried with pagans generations ago, and the city of Samaria was uh, judged harshly by the Jews. They were compromised Jews, and so a lot of times they would walk around Samaria to not even give them the business, not even give them any business. We're going to walk around, but Jesus, with his disciples, right, walks right into Samaria. Love Jesus. And uh, he has this conversation with this woman at the well. And they have this long conversation. It takes all John 4. And uh, Jesus asks her for some water, and they get into a conversation about her husbands, and uh, Jesus reads her mail, exposes kind of the reality of her situation, and then she begins to have theological conversations with Jesus about where true worship should take place. Is it in Samaria or in Jerusalem? They go have this long conversation. But the impact of what Jesus had on her life, in verse 25, John 4, it says, The woman said I, to Jesus, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. I'm the Messiah. If you want a direct verse of when Jesus claims to be the Messiah, this is it. And then it goes on, verse 27. Just then his disciples returned, and they were surprised to find him talking with a woman, let alone a Samaritan. But no one asked, what do you want, or why are you talking to her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who's told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of the town, and they made their way towards him. 
story goes on, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. But when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed for two whole days. And because of his words, many more became believers. And they said to the woman, we, are no, longer, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. The Samaritan's woman's testimony changed the trajectory of not only the villagers in her village, but even the trajectory of the village itself. Testimonies, here's a main fact about testimony. Testimonies draw people to Jesus. Your story, when shared, draws people's hearts to Jesus. Now look at this other testimony John shares in John 9. There's a man who was born blind, and Jesus happens to heal this man born blind, and also on the Sabbath which was you weren't supposed to do anything good on the Sabbath, right? So some of the Pharisees in verse 16. Oh, so let me set this up a little bit more. Uh, so news spread far and wide of this young man's healing, and uh, it attracted the attention of the Pharisees. These were the religious teachers of the law. These were uh, pretty much self-righteous followers of the Torah and the Babylonian Talmud, and uh, Jesus Jesus was not a very good friend to these Pharisees because he exposed that they were fakes. And so they bring this young man in and they interview him. And uh, this young man had been healed. Said Some of the Pharisees said, this man Jesus is not from God for he's working on the Sabbath. Others said, but how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was deep division of opinion among them. So the Pharisees called this young man to testify. They didn't believe him. So they call, uh, call up his parents to testify on his behalf. And they did testify. We know that this is our son, and we know that he was born blind at birth. And then verse 24, therefore, his parents said, he's of age. Ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been born blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. <laughs> he, the healed man, answered, Whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, though I was blind, now I see. A man who was just testifying as to what Jesus had done. We see this full-blown courage of a beggar. A mere beggar standing up to the most religious, most educated people in Israel. Pharisees wanted this newly sighted brother to denounce Jesus and with a veiled threat that if he doesn't go along with uh, giving glory to God, that he, they have the power to excommunicate him. Now, that's very different back then than it would be today, right? Today, if you get excommunicated or kicked out, you could just go to another church down the block. But yet in his day, if you were excommunicated from the community, you were, you were out, And his personal testimony of what God had done trumped all the fear in the room. And that's what testimonies do. They trump bad arguments, usually rooted in fear. They trump them, especially if they're bad arguments about Jesus. This man was way less educated than anybody else in all these rooms. And he had been born blind all his life. All he simply said with all boldness, look, you may, have some thing, you may know some things that I don't, but I can see. His story and the sharing of it revealed truth. Testimonies revealed truth. Testimonies revealed the truth of God and His created order. The truth of who God is. Truth of who the actual blind guides are through this Blind guy's testimony, it revealed who really the blind guides are. Not Jesus, but the Pharisees. And I'll say this, God is writing and proclaiming his story in, with, and through your life. Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's handiwork 
created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for you to do, which is, man, many things he's done in your life already. There's many things that in this season he's doing right now. And then there's things that in advance he's prepared in advance for you to walk in. Those are the testimonies that he has placed ahead of your path for you to enter in, walk in, and glorify God in and through it. Acts 4.33 says, For with great power the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. God speaks to people through testimonies. Every testimony brings something of heaven into the atmosphere. It gives us a divine moment when things shift and are transformed because of the record of what God has done is made known. Oh, it's so good. As we hear what God's done, it releases faith that if he did it back then, he can do it again. And if you actually get into the root word, the Hebrew root of testimony, it means to do it again. For the Apostle Paul, many times, he would walk up into a city and before preaching the gospel, it would be something that Paul would do almost every time he went and preached, is he would share and lead off with his testimony. You can see this in Acts 21, 22, when he's kind of given a formal uh, presentation to King Agrippa. But a lot of times, Paul was sharing his story. I'm opening up this conversation, sharing with you what my story is, where I came from, what God did in my life, and where he's brought me. So he says this, 1 Corinthians 2. And so it was with me, my brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power. And you see it all over in the book of Acts. God's people are preaching, they're testifying as what God's doing, and then God's power comes. A lot of times in the middle of the meeting. And like we read in Revelation, Paul used his testimony and the gospel, not loving his life unto death. That's why he was so fruitful. We see this in Peter, too. 1 Peter 2 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, so that, all right, you have all that, so that, You may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You may declare the praises. So here's a few psalms. Come and hear all who fear God, and I will tell you what he's done for my soul. Psalm 71, I will tell everyone about your righteousness. All day long I proclaim your saving power, though I'm not skilled with words. I will praise your mighty deeds, O sovereign Lord. I will tell everyone that you alone are just. O God, you have taught me from my earliest childhood, and I constantly tell others about the wonderful things that you do. Now that I'm old and gray, do not abandon me, O God. Let me proclaim your power to this new generation, that your mighty miracles to all who come after me. There's a foreboding sense over the church that the next generation of the church is going to be weaker than it currently is. What changes the trajectory is this, sharing continually what God has done in your life, in your friend's life, in your parents' generation, in your grandparents' generation. You knowing what God has done roots you and establishes you in who you are in God. And so that when you walk out in the world, you know that your, your, your mind isn't dictated by the news cycle, but by, by the testimonies of God. How about this? Psalm 119. Don't believe me? This is it. Psalm 119.99. For I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. God gives you insight. 
when you feed off of the testimonies of what God has done. Your testimonies are my meditation. If his testimonies are your meditation, you will be smarter than everyone around you. Why? Not that you're physically, intellectually smarter than everyone else, but it's because of who's counseling you. Who's counseling you? My fears aren't counseling me. God's testimonies are counseling me. So David stood on his testimony when facing Goliath. Check this one out. Now David, he was the youngest of his whole family. Father was Jesse. Let's set this up. His brother, his brothers were on the battle line. The Philistines and the Israelites were facing off with one another. They, the Philistines had Goliath. Goliath issued a challenge. Send one of your warriors... And we're going to fight mano y mano. If I win, you become our slaves. If he wins, we'll become yours. And so for 40 days, they go out, they get dressed up for war, and for 40 days, they go out to the battle line and yell at the Philistines. That was what their battle plan was. They were too afraid to actually send anyone out. Then here comes David with a little meal to feed his brothers. And David gets a sense of seeing what's going on, and Goliath is cursing Yahweh. He's defying Yahweh. And David is like, oh my gosh, who is this uncircumcised Philistines that's dishonoring the armies of the living God? Like you see this righteousness just well up in David. And then he says this, Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear... He will, deliver me, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Now, what is that? David is taking some testimonies of what God had done in his past. God, you saved me from the lion. You saved me from the bear. And just like that, God, your testimony, I'm bringing it back in to the current day. I know that you're going to do the same thing with this Philistine. You can fight. David fought with the testimony of God against Goliath and won. David had cultivated it within his own heart during the monotonous days as a shepherd in the field with the Lord. I mean, imagine a shepherd day in, day out. Whew, pretty boring, you know? Your cloud formations and, you know, seeing bunnies, you know, that, that gets old after a couple weeks, right? So this monotony... There was something about in the monotonous day in, day out, that David was able to see the Lord's working, his protection, his activity in his life. God, thank you. That's a story that I now that's forever on my testimony tool belt. And not to be cheesy with it, but that's the image that kind of came to mind, is that God has is arsaling a bunch of stories of his faithfulness, of his goodness, of what he's done in your life as like a tool belt. So that when you go out into the world and you meet people and you hear of other people's stories or other people's pain or other people's brokenness, you may look down and find that you have an exact right tool, a.k.a. story, for that person to hear. And that, like Paul, is how you masterfully, like an expert craftsman, able to pull a piece of your story in order to minister to the person next to you. And with that, it comes a supernatural seed of what Jesus has done in your life. It opens up people's imagination of what, God, what could you do in mine? God, if you could break through those kind of addictions in their life, God, what could you do in mine? God, if you could set them free from depression and give them a joy that they can't even describe, God, I don't even know what that's like. I want that. So think about your childhood, your life experiences, what God did that led you to surrender to him, if you've surrendered. Maybe you haven't yet. Maybe today would be the day that you say, God, I've given you excuses why not to serve you my whole life. Today, I give you my whole life. God, write in me a story that's worthy of your praise, worthy of your glory. Or what God has done in your life since. Not only salvation, but healing, victory, provision, answered prayer, words of knowledge. 
I'll say this, your testimonies are stories of what God has done when spoken, become a mighty weapon in the spiritual war over the lives of men and women. So, day in, day out, God wants to teach us so we learn how to sensitively respond to the need of the moment around others with the portion of your story that through God's Spirit, hey, share that. Hey, share that. And I mean really share it. Don't gloss it over. Don't make it a religious, you know, just story. Give them the raw goods of what God has done in your life. When people hear what God has done, man, it parts the clouds to where God's light can come in. It may take us a minute to realize that our greatest places that God will use us in our life is when we tell people what God has done. Many times it will be through our greatest challenges, maybe your greatest pains and traumas. But think about this. How does God transform people? Kind of three primary ways. First one would be divine intervention. Stories about that all over. Um, so many Muslims in the Muslim community are having dreams of Jesus. Jesus is coming to them in dreams. That's why Mike's story, when I heard that, I was like, man, God's doing that all over the planet. So there is divine intervention. Then there's faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when people open up their Bible and read, that's when they get to read about what God's done. Read about the testimonies of God. And it changes their life. So you've got divine intervention. You've got them reading the scripture themselves. But then, really, the last one is them hearing about what God has done through another person's life. Now, for an unbeliever, they may not have a divine intervention. They may not be, being in, they may not be reading their Bible. But if they aren't, what are they left with? They're left with what God has done in your life. Them hearing it. And God breaking open in their life. Romans 10. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never even heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is what the scriptures mean when they say, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news your feet are beautiful because they carry with it a story woven by God himself. If you have the Holy Spirit, you're an empowered saint that's sent out to shine and reflect who Jesus is. So here's a few testimonies. Can I share a couple, a couple stories and then we'll wrap up? A um, uh, long time ago, first one of the first people I ever prayed for was my own mom. She had breast cancer for the second time. She had radiation that kind of shut down her, her throat kind of apparatus. And there was many times that she was out to dinner, uh, out to lunch with my dad, and uh, she, would, she would choke. And so my dad would have to Heimlich, and it happened more than a handful of times. And uh, they came and visited, Becky and I, when we were living in Manhattan, and we were out to lunch, and, it was, and she choked, and my dad had to... And uh, it was the first time I had seen it personally. And then my mom cries because it was emotional and she doesn't want to draw attention to herself. And it was kind of an emotional day. And so uh, before they hit the trail to go back to Colorado, I was, just felt this urge, pray for her. I'm like, God, I don't know. It's my own mom, you know. It's like, but no, pray for her. So we laid hands on her throat, called a week later and said, my throat's never been the same was on a plane with a guy that, stro that had uh, sight issues. He was colorblind. Started asking questions about when did that start? Oh, about six years ago. Started get asking a few more questions about his life and realized that about six years ago, he left God and started following this woman around. <laughs> so I'm like, you never put the two to two together. He's like, no, I never even thought about it. But now that you said it, holy cow. So we prayed for him. And uh, I just, I felt from the Lord, as you walk out in victory, the Lord will give you your, your color back. Four years later, I get a call back. He's got all his color back because he walked out of the sin that he was in. Uh, we were up at UMKC here many years ago 
uh, had a table that we would pray for people. And we had over 800 students come up, and there was words of knowledge, people, things that uh, I didn't know, but the Holy Spirit knew about their past. And in prayer, God would give you insight into their past to say, hey, God wants to minister to you in that area of your life. A couple months back, heard a, this one got the rounds. Uh, a missionary just got back from Haiti, and, uh, and uh, they were ministering in this village, and it was very hostile to the Christians. And uh, one day, this missionary was out in the marketplace, and one of the witches or witch doctors comes up to this man and curses him in front of the whole marketplace. And that Christian says, hey, you're Curse has no authority over me. I'm under the blood and power of Jesus Christ. Well, the next day, that man who cursed him, his hand completely withered. The next day, that guy died. And and the fear of the Lord fell across all the village. And they've become responsive to the gospel ever since. Just yesterday, just yesterday, heard of amazing testimony. No, two days ago, Friday. This happened on Friday in Colorado Springs. Rhett, my son, he's off to the Philippines, left yet last night, praise God. Anyway, uh, then on to Indonesia. But uh, one of their missionaries there at the YWAM base, it was the day before everyone was leaving. So they had the big pool party. So they're out playing around, messing around, and two girls were chasing one another. And uh, one girl saw the fence and jumped it, and the other girl didn't. And... uh, Uh, The other girl that was chasing hyperextended her knee severely bad. So so much so that she was throwing up every time they moved her. It was so bad. So it was almost like this missionary who was leaving to go to another country the next day hyperextended her knee. So they load her up. They they get her in the car. and, uh, And the whole base begins praying. On the way to the hospital... She sits up, she goes, all my pain's gone, Jesus just healed my knee. And it's like, come on now, that's what our God does. That's what our God does. God wants to do the same thing in and through your life. Create testimony after testimony after testimony of how good God is, because he puts it on display through you. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you God for the story that you've put in our life. Father, I pray that, Lord, if we're too familiar with it or we feel like it has no power, God, I pray that we would repent right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we know that that power, that that story has the power to break curses, has the power to break bondage, has the power to open people up to Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray that you would be on our lips and be on our hearts meditation of our hearts, that they would be focused around you and the testimony of you and what you can do in and through and with our life. Lord, open up our mouths. Lord, let us 10x our testimony, God. 10x our testimony this this next season. And let us stand back and see what you do, Father, as we share to others what you've done in our life. Father, thank you so much for the authoring and the finishing of our faith. Lord, you not only author it, you finish it. Bring us, bring us forward. Let us grow up in you and let us be ones that know how to testify as to the goodness of God to the people around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a good good Labor Day weekend.